All right, I do want to talk about the nature of oaks today. Uh, and my story starts in July 2000, when my wife Cindy and I bought a chunk of a farm that was broken up and sold. Uh, it was a very old farm, it had been mowed for hay, the last thing they did. Uh, so there weren't many plants there at all. And our goal was to restore the biodiversity on this property. About a mile down the street were a couple of white oaks that had produced a lot of acorns. So we got some of those acorns, planted them. Uh, white oak acorns germinate in the fall. They send down their, their root, their radical, uh, but that's all they do in the fall. And then in the spring, they send up their first sets of leaves. And that's all they do in the spring. They just sit there and it gives oaks the, the impression or people the impression that oaks don't grow very fast. Uh, but what they're doing that first year, the first couple of years is building a massive root system. In the first year, oaks grow 10 times more root biomass than leaf biomass. So here's my little oak that we're gonna follow. I put a, a deer cage around it so that uh, it, it stayed long enough for us to follow. And this is what the house looked like in year one. 18 years later, that's the tree. It's 45 feet tall, a circumference of 40, uh, 47 inches, canopy spread of 30 feet. Of course, it's still a baby, but it's a real tree. It's a real landscape tree. Now, oaks are the lifeline to an awful lot of creatures that are out there. Dozens of bird species, lots of, of mammal species and, and reptiles. There's several butterflies that depend on oaks, but there's hundreds of species of moths that depend on oaks, plus their predators and their parasitoids. Sinipid gall wasps all depend on oaks. Lots of beetles, June beetles, longhorn beetles, metallic wood boring beetles, weevils, many spiders, dozens more species of arthropods, mollusks and annelids that live in the, the uh, leaf litter that oaks create. So it is a lifeline to countless creatures, but this diverse web of life goes unnoticed by most people that have oaks in their yard. They just don't know that any of this is happening on their oaks. And that's why I wrote this book, The Nature of Oaks. It is a month by month guide to the life that is occurring on the oaks in your yard. And I did this because knowledge generates interest and interest generates compassion. And we need a lot more compassion for the life around us. We need it not just for the life around us, but we need it for our own good because it's the life around us that keeps us alive on this planet. So before we start, I wanna uh, get a few facts out about the genus Quercus, the oaks. Uh, in, in North America, it contains 91 species, 435 species of oaks globally. The word Quercus comes from the Celtic meaning, uh, quer meaning fine, and quez meaning tree. So oaks are fine trees, and they are indeed. Uh, there are four main taxonomic sections in the genus in North America. We've got the Quercus white oak group, Lobati red oak group, Varentes live oak group, and then a uh, much smaller group in the West, proto the Canyon Oak Group. This is a, a picture of the range of oaks in North America. Um, the brown is the only place where oaks don't occur naturally. Every other place, uh, at least one species of oak occurs. In the darker green, you've got a, a number of species. So they're not universally uh, throughout North America, but they do cover most of the, the continent. Oaks have a long life, life cycle, very long, uh, up to 900 years on average, believe it or not. There's 300 years of growth, 300 years of stasis, and 300 years of decline. And during each one of those, those periods, they're delivering unique ecological services to the land around them. The largest or the longest lived oak in, in North America that we know of is uh, a Southern live oak called the Middleton Oak. Uh, it's 1500 years old. Um, that's the, the estimate, that's, that's the longest one. The Y oak was the oldest white oak in the country. Uh, I got to see it before it fell over in a storm, but you can see they do get uh, very large. One of the messages today though is not all oaks are large and some of them are small enough to use very, very uh, easily in a small landscape as landscape trees. Okay, oaks have superior ecological function. I do wanna focus on this. They have the highest biodiversity value and we'll talk about each one of these things. They're sequestering more carbon dioxide than uh, other trees. They're the best soil stabilizers. They make the best leaf litter. They promote healthier watersheds, all very valuable ecological contributions to our landscapes. Um, so what I'm gonna do is start in October and march through the year and talk about what's happening on that oak that I planted in my, my front yard. And people say, why'd you start in October? I started in October because that's when I decided to start. There's no, no uh, rhyme or reason to it. Uh, I looked out the window, that's what I saw. So 
It's also the month of acorns. Acorns are a really important, important feature of oaks. A single oak can produce up to 3 million acorns in its lifetime. And uh, there's an awful lot of creatures that depend on those, those acorns. Lots of mammals, particularly rodents, uh, big guys, bears depend on acorns. Certainly our squirrels are those cute little deer. They're all eating acorns. Many birds uh, use acorns as well. Turkeys really eat a lot of acorns in the fall. Um, red belly woodpeckers, tip mice, towhees, things we don't even think of as depending on, on acorns. Uh, nuthatches, flickers, ducks, believe it or not. Wood ducks in particular really love acorns. They'll dive for the acorns that fall into the water and they come out on the shore and, and eat acorns. Then there are a number of insects that eat acorns, particularly acorn weevils. This is an acorn weevil larva tunneling out through an acorn. That's what the adult looks like. There are acorn moths, several species of moths that look very uh, similar to each other called acorn uh, moths in the genus Blastobasis. So at the end of the season, all the acorns that fall from a tree end up looking like this. They, they all seem to be destroyed. And you might wonder how oaks ever reproduce successfully at all with all those things eating the acorns. And this is where the J comes in. Um, the relationship between Js all over the world and oaks is a very old one. It's an ancient mutualism. Uh, and it's Js that allow oaks to reproduce successfully, very successfully, as a matter of fact. They both evolved in Southeast Asia about 65 million years ago. Uh, and jays, of course, are getting food from uh, oaks in the form of those acorns, like so many other things. But jays are allowing oaks to move, to disperse faster than any other uh, type of tree in the world. How do they do that? Well, the jays are taking acorns and using them, uh, storing those acorns for food during the winter time. They don't cache acorns, so they don't bury a bunch in the, in the same place. They will bury them singly. They can carry more than one at a time, but they'll bury them singly. So they pick one up and they'll fly up to a mile from the parent tree, which is much farther than other acorn dispersers move acorns. Um, then they tap the acorn below the surface of the ground. And the idea is that they're going to go and get it in the wintertime and have something to eat. If they think another jay has watched them bury an acorn, they'll wait a few minutes uh, and then they'll dig it up and move that acorn to a new spot because uh, jays know that jays steal. Then, of course, during the winter, they're going to go get those acorns. Well, a single jay can bury up to 4,500 acorns each fall. The thing of it is, they only remember where one out of every four acorns is. So if, if they're lucky, they recover one out of four acorns, which means uh, they are actually planting 3,360 oak trees each year. And if they do that a mile from the parent tree, that's what enables oaks to move faster than any other tree genus. Um, so it's not just blue jays, it's uh, all the jay species we have in North America and through Central America, Europe, they are all moving acorns. Uh, okay, November. Now you might have noticed that in some years we have a lot of acorns and some years we don't have very many at all. Uh, when we have a lot of acorns, that's called an oak mast, uh, the masting behavior. The oaks are not the only trees that mast, but they're the, some of the most obvious ones. They're producing uh, the, the members of a particular oak group are all making their acorns at the same time. Uh, it's unusual behavior, so of course ecologists ask, why are they doing this? Well, there are four main hypotheses about why oaks mast, and we'll talk about each one, predator satiation, predator reduction, improved pollination, and energy partitioning. Okay, predator satiation. This is an acorn weevil larva, uh, and they can get really numerous. Uh, in acorns. And some 90% of the acorns can be uh, um, attacked by acorn weevil larvae. And then you've got all those other predators out there eating, eating the acorns. Well, if, a, if an oak tree produces a lot of acorns every single year, the population size of all these acorn eaters will stabilize around the size of that acorn production. Uh, and they'll end up eating almost every single one of those, those acorns. But if oak acorn production is variable, if they make a whole bunch one year, the populations of those predators will explode. And then the very next year, there'll be very few acorns. This is actually called predator reduction. So all of those exploded populations will then, then crash. Uh, and then, then the next time the oaks mast to make a lot of acorns, there won't be enough predators to eat them all. So masting is, is a way to satiate the predator population and actually control the acorn predator population below the level where they will eat all of the acorns. Improved pollination, oaks are wind pollinated. 
Uh, and if they all produce their, if they all synchronize when they're releasing their pollen and they release a whole lot of pollen at once, it improves the, the um, chances that the female flowers on oaks will be successfully pollinated. So that synchronization improves pollination. And then energy allocation, there's rarely enough energy to go around. So in some years, oaks put the energy towards reproduction, towards egg corn uh, production. And in other years, they put it towards growth, but not towards egg, egg corn production. Rarely do they have enough energy to put it towards growth and uh, egg corn production at the same time. So uh, the fact that, that uh, egg corn production is variable uh, could simply be a, a matter of, of allocating limited amounts of energy. It's important to point out that those four hypotheses are not mutually exclusive. They all could be happening at the same time. On to December. Uh, another thing you might notice uh, in December and, and onward in the wintertime is that some oaks, particularly in the white oak group, do not drop all of their leaves. They hold their leaves in the wintertime. That's a condition called marcescence. It's very common uh, on younger trees, and it's very common on juvenile leaves of older trees. So again, we've got to explain this. Why are they holding their leaves? Other deciduous trees drop their leaves. Uh, and the leading hypothesis is that it wasn't that long ago, um, so only some 10,000 years ago at the end of the, the uh, last glaciation, we had lots of huge mammals in, in North America. And many of those were browsers. This is a, a, a picture of just some of the large mammals that occurred in Mexico. Three species of mammoths, the giant sloth and camels and elk. And, and uh, you know, in the, in the world, there were, I think, 44 species of rhinoceros. I mean, a lot of big mammals out there browsing exactly the way white-tailed deer browse today. And browsing is when you're not eating grass off the ground, you're eating the meristematic tissue, the buds of trees and shrubs. Well, in order to, so the hypothesis is that in order to protect their tissues from all of these, these uh, large mammals, oaks kept the dead leaves and, and surrounding those new buds for the following spring. And it, it made it very difficult for these browsers to eat those buds without getting a mouthful of, of dry leaves. Uh, so all of a sudden, what was a tasty good resource is, is now um, not very tasty and, and difficult to obtain. It's also difficult to eat those leaves without making a lot of noise. So the dry, dry leaves you know, have that crinkly sound. And there were a lot of predators around that were tracking these, these large herbivores. So, <clears throat> so that's the thinking. And one thing that supports that hypothesis is that the marcescence goes up about 18 feet, and that was the maximum reach of the giant sloth and, and some, some other the big mammals. They couldn't reach any higher than that, so there's no marcescence up here where those mammals couldn't reach. So it really does support the, the hypothesis that this has something to do with the browsing by those, high, those large mammals. The fact that uh, oaks, particularly our younger uh, members of the genus, <coughs> have marcescence gives it a valuable landscape attribute that other deciduous trees don't have. If they're retaining their leaves, they can actually serve as screens during the winter time, even though they're deciduous. Um, so we can use that to our, our landscape advantage. January, January is cold, not much is happening outside. If you go out and you stare up at, at the trees, you don't see much. But if you stare very hard, occasionally you can see small birds foraging, or at least it looks like they're foraging. So things like the golden crown kinglet, our chickadees, our titmice are scrambling around up in those branches, and it looks like they're looking for food. Well, we all know there's no food up there. Entomologists know there's no food up there. But we're all wrong. Um, Bern Heinrich uh, wondered what they were doing up there as well. Uh, you might know Bern, he's, the, he's a retired entomologist in New England at this point, but he writes a, a column in Natural History magazine every month. He actually looked in the crops of golden crown kinglets in Maine in January, and he found they were full of caterpillars. So they are finding caterpillars up in those, those uh, dormant branches. What are the caterpillars doing up there? They're, they're looking like branches, for one thing. Um, so there's a caterpillar there. No wonder we didn't know they were up there. And they're just sitting. There's no green leaves to eat. They just sit there all winter long. Another caterpillar here. When the temperature goes below freezing, they have antifreeze proteins in their cells, and it keeps their cells from bursting while below freezing. And then when it goes above freezing, the, the caterpillar expands a little bit, but it simply spends the entire winter sitting there. And if the birds don't find it, um, you might wonder, what are they doing that for? Why don't they overwinter as, as an egg or a pupa? 
or even as an adult, as most other, other caterpillars and, and uh, moths and butterflies do. If they make it through the winter and not being eaten, um, they are ready to go when the new leaves come out. So if, if the overwinter is eggs or pupae, uh, the new, new leaves come out and there's, it's a couple of weeks before they're ready to eat them. But those large caterpillars are ready to go. So they're, they're first in line at the dinner table if they make it through the winter. February, this is actually the quietest time of year for, for oaks. So it's a good time to look for us to look at oak landscaping myths. You know, myths are all based on, on some degree of, of fact. Most myths are anyway. Uh, and here are some of the things I hear all the time about why people don't want to plant oaks. They're too expensive. They grow too slowly to use as landscape plants. Uh, they're too big to use on small lots. If you plant them, they're gonna grow big and then crush your house, fall over on your house, or their roots will lift up your sidewalk or your driveway. Uh, so to what degree are all of these myths, myths and what degree are they, are they facts? Are oaks too expensive? Well, they are too expensive if you insist on instant gratification. In other words, if you insist on planting a large tree. Um, so there's two reasons you shouldn't do that. First of all, they are expensive. You plant a large tree like this, it can cost $3,000. But it's a bad idea in terms of tree health because any tree that's grown in a pot to any size is going to be root bound, particularly oaks, because they do have large root systems. They grow quickly. They want to spread out. A root bound uh, tree, of course, wraps the, the roots around and around a circle. And as they grow, if you plant this, uh, they will strangle each other. So the tree won't die right away, but four, five, 10 years later, it strangles itself and then it does die. Uh, the other alternative, of course, is a bald and burlap tree where uh, the, the, um, the roots are not root bound, but they're chopped off. So uh, the, you've got to root prune a, a tree uh, a great deal in order to transplant it and, and get a, a tree of any size. Uh, and when you transplant that tree, it's got a 50% chance of dying simply because of the shock of all the, the root pruning. Uh, and it'll take up to a decade or more to rebuild the root system. So it just sits there. So you lose the advantage of having a, a big tree. If you plant an acorn the same day you plant one of these root prune trees, in 10 years, the acorn will be a bigger, healthier, much healthier tree because it's, going to, it's never going to lose that root system and it will grow much faster. This is the size that uh, oak trees want to be planted or acorns. Uh, so you do have to wait a little bit because they grow slowly in the beginning, but then they really take off. The, the uh, oaks on my property that I planted as either two foot bare root whips or as acorns are now 60, 70 feet tall, many of them. So uh, it's been 20 years, but boy, that went fast. So we didn't have to wait too long. Uh, what about that, that question, do oaks grow too slowly? let's have a race between the white oak I planted in my front yard, there it is, and my little friend Bella here. People think that's my daughter. No, it's not, not my daughter. It's a daughter of a friend of mine. And we, we spend a lot of time with, with Bella. So here the oak is six years old uh, and it's really starting to come into its own. Bella is two years old and we're gonna have a race. I know the oak has a head start here, but uh, here it's six years old, seven years old, eight years old, nine years old, Bella is losing. 10 years old, 11 years old, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and here the oak is 20 years old, and there's, this is 2020, Bella is wearing her mask, so we know what year it, it is. Uh, she's taller than me now, she's a, a full adult, but she has clearly lost the race. Again, this is our tree, it's a baby tree, but it didn't grow all that slowly. So, you know, this, this idea that oaks grow too slowly to appreciate, for us to appreciate, you know, if they have to be 400 years old before you can appreciate them, you, that's right, uh, you're, you're not going to be able to do that. But um, you can appreciate what they do ecologically right away in your yard. This is a pin oak in my yard that has pushed its head above the leaves, and there's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating, eating the leaves. They start to contribute energy to your local food web almost immediately. So you don't have to wait for that ecological contribution. And if you watch it, you can appreciate it. Are oaks too large to use in uh, small yards? Here are two red oaks in uh, a yard. Um, actually, there's several uh, houses in Newark, Delaware. I drive by them on the way to, to uh, the University of Delaware. They probably were planted when the house was built. So they're over 100 years old at this point. They're huge. 
Uh, they have shaded that house for 100 years and dropped the temperature 10 degrees. And in you know, the years before air conditioning, that was important. Um, now, you're never going to find a landscape designer that will recommend you put a large tree in a tiny space like this. But uh, it, it, can, it can happen. Here's a, a very big, I can't remember what kind of an oak it was, maybe a shingle oak, uh, in front of a, a very big church here. Fortunately, they did not cut it down. It's right in the corner. There's almost no space at all, but it's a huge tree in a very small place. The point I want to make, though, is that we do have small oak options. You don't have to use uh, small, uh, big trees in small spaces. In the east, we've got dwarf chestnut oak, Quercus prinoides, Georgia oak, which is occasionally in the, uh, in the nursery industry, Quercus georgiana, blackjack oak, runner oak, dwarf live oak is a good one for the south, myrtle oak, chapman oak. These are all uh, small trees. I've got a dwarf chestnut oak in my yard. It made acorns when it was five feet tall. Um, so these are options that don't take up a huge amount of space. In the West, there are many more options, and some of them are actually ground covers. Um, so there are small options for oaks, and we want to get more of those into the nursery tree. There's my dwarf chestnut oak here, here acorns. I'm looking down on it. Another, another way to make uh, small oaks in your yard with large trees is through coppicing. Now, coppicing used to be a, um, it was a practice uh, in the old days, uh, where they wanted uh, thin stems of lots of different plants to make baskets and all kinds of other things. So they would saw off a tree like an oak when it was three or four inches in diameter. And then when it came back, it was more or less like a, a shrub. So here's a red oak uh, that, um, you know, it's, it's an oak bush. And if you do that periodically, it's never going to get big. It can be in a small space, but its foliage can contribute to your landscape in a very productive way. Will oaks crush your house? Uh, well, maybe, but it depends on how we plant them and, and what the ground conditions are when we plant them. Uh, of course, you know, with our media today, if an oak falls over, or if a tree falls on a house or a car anywhere, we hear about it. And it makes it sound like all the trees that are out there are falling on every, every house. And of course, Ida uh, just went through, we're having huge storms. It's very hard on our trees. But one of the problems is the way we plant those trees. We plant every one of them as specimen plants. We want them to, to be able to reach their full, full height and full spread, full grandeur. We don't want them to, to compete with any other plant. So we isolate them from other trees, which means they can't um, interlock their roots with other trees. So when you get a lot of rain and wind, psh, over they go. It does happen, but this is the way trees grow in a forest. They grow much closer together. They, their roots system becomes a, a very stable matrix. And in a big wind, you typically do not get blow downs. You get, uh, it might snap it off. If you have a, a tornado, nothing's gonna protect you against a tornado. But um, go to a stream cut. This is where you can see what, oak, what, what roots in general are doing. This is one, two, three, four different trees. Their roots are locked together in a really stable way, and the wind is not going to blow those guys over. So rather than planting our trees like this, let's make what I'm calling groves of trees. We can have oak groves. Now here's two white oaks that uh, survived the, the uh, introduction of this street here. Um, they, they grew naturally. They're, uh, what, they're on a five-foot center here. Uh, now again, nobody would recommend doing that, except I'm recommending doing that plant them small. Those trees have their roots locked in together. They're not going to blow over. Here's a, this is called the Three Sisters in Northwest Connecticut. So three um, oak trees that uh, grew up together. Their roots are all locked together. Very, very stable. This is a plan planting. This is at Mount Cuba Center in, in one of the DuPont estates in Hocassin, Delaware. Uh, there's a big red oak back here, but we've got hemlocks here, little hardscape, rhododendrons down here. Uh, this was planted in the 30s uh, as a, a planned less landscape. So you have a, a grove here right in the middle of, of a yard. It's a functional um, oak grove or, or plant grove that's extremely stable. Nothing's going to blow over in there. It's real good habitat for uh, a lot of creatures. Now, none of these things are, are specimen trees. So you appreciate it as a group rather than as individuals. But that's the way to keep your trees from blowing over. Well, oaks lift up your sidewalks or your driveways. Uh, if you plant them on bedrock, if you plant one of the shallow rooted uh, oaks, like, like willow oak, for example, um, their oaks can run very shallow and they can lift up hardscape. But there are a number of trees that have deep rooted oaks, uh, like pin oak, red oak. 
here are two big red oaks at the University of Delaware. Look how close they are to the, to the curb. Huge trees, they're not lifting up anything because the roots have gone down and under. So it is not at all a given that your, your large trees are going to lift up your hardscape. If you're planning over a pan, an agricultural pan created by plowing for centuries, uh, the oaks will run along the top of that, that um, compacted soil. So you want to break up that pan first, but uh, most of the time the roots will go deep enough so that you don't have to worry about that. Okay, that's it with our, our myths. Let's move on to March. This is when those marcescent leaves are finally starting to drop. They're finally starting to accumulate leaf litter under the tree. And oak leaves are extremely variable. Of course, you have got 91 species, uh, so you, you would expect a lot of uh, variation in oak leaves. So this is a picture of just some of the shapes and sizes of oak leaves. That's an oak leaf, believe it or not. That looks like a holly leaf, but it's really an, an oak. Um, so lots of sizes and shapes. A large oak tree can make 700,000 leaves each year. And if you, if you laid them all out next to each other, it would cover four tennis courts. Well, those leaves uh, have a really important ecological role. They provide a protective blanket on the forest floor, which is, which is protecting our soil, our soil biota, our soil organisms, the moisture in the soil, and they're slowly breaking down, returning the nutrients that that tree used to the soil where it can use them again. Uh, remember, our soil is harboring, harboring more species than any, any, uh, anything is happening above ground. So these species are, are uh, tiny. And before I leave this picture, this reminds me, a lot of people say, well, I can't, I've got to rake away all the leaf litter because my ferns and my other plants can't grow through them. Yes, they can. Uh, now you can't pile five feet worth of, of leaf litter there and expect things to get through it. But uh, most of our, our native plants are really good at breaking through leaf litter. And it forms a very healthy blanket on the forest floor. In a single square meter of, of uh, soil under an oak tree, you can have 250,000 mites, you can have 100,000 springtails. This is a Columbulan springtail, uh, a smintheridae. Uh, you can have 90,000 proturans, which you'd need a microscope to see, the tiny little very primitive insects that are, that are white. A million nematodes, a lot of life happening in that one square meter. But none of it's going to happen if it dries out. Uh, if it's exposed to the sun, if, uh, if um, there's erosion and the soil is washed away because there's nothing protecting it, and that's the role of, of leaf litter. Um, some of the, the, the uh, more beautiful creatures that live there would include the banded hair streak. It develops on oak leaf litter on the ground, just like this. I've never found a banded hair streak caterpillar, but the adults are common and I know they're down there. They just look like the leaves and very tough to find. But there are 70 species of moths, we call them litter moths, that where the caterpillars actually eat the dead leaves, just like the banded hair streak. Things like the ambiguous litter moth, uh, American idea, dark spotted palthus. Um, these guys are all, they're very common in my yard eating leaf litter. And then you have all the predators that are eating those caterpillars and all those other living things in, in the ground. So it's really a, a um, so these are crabbed predator beetles, a number of species of those and lots of spiders. Uh, it's a thriving community that is thriving only if you keep the leaf litter around. Okay, April. This is uh, when the oak buds finally break, uh, and it is the time of year that gives you the chance to see one of the most ephemeral biological interactions in all of nature. It lasts about five minutes a year. Uh, and it occurs on the meristematic tissue of, of oaks, the, the buds just as they're starting to swell and break. And I'm talking about when sinipid gall wasps start to create their galls. Um, so here we have a, a, an oak bud, it's just starting to swell. This is a female sinipid. This is a male who has already mated with her, but he's hanging around to make sure this male does not mate with her too, because as soon as she finishes laying an egg in this, this bud, he's gonna mate with her again. Uh, and he doesn't want this guy to, to get in there. Uh, so that's her ovipositor right there. She's depositing a, a, an egg into the tissue. And along with that egg, she's injecting the cells with plant hormones that manipulate how they grow. Uh, so think of, of a bud as, as a bunch of stem cells, undifferentiated. They can grow into any shape or size and an interaction between the plant hormones that the sinipid injects and the oak itself create uh, very specific shapes. And within that shape, the gall is where the larva of this, this uh, wasp develops. 
So here's a, a different species of gall wasp. I took this this spring, laying an egg in the uh, this bud here, and then I tagged it. That's the gall that was created from that oviposition event uh, a few weeks later. People liken galls to cancerous growths on trees. I don't like that analogy because cancer cells keep growing. Uh, they're, they're uncontrolled and that's the problem with them. This is very controlled, highly controlled growth that creates species specific shapes, species specific galls uh, that help you identify what the species of gauler is. There are 5,000 species of cynipid gaulers that use oaks worldwide. A single oak tree can support 70 different species of of gallers. And you can see they can be, they can be quite pretty. Now, most gallers are, are nearly hollow, which is curious. This is the uh, apple oak gall. And if you cut it open, uh, you've got a, a, the real galler is inside the uh, very hard capsule right in the middle here. But uh, you have these rays extending from a hollow space. Here's the outside of the gall. What is that all about? Why do we have that hollow space? Well, it turns out that gallers have more natural enemies in the form of of uh, insect parasitoids, hymenopteran parasitoids, other wasps that are laying eggs in, in the cynipid. When you actually rear out a, a gall, if you pick a gall off a tree, put it in a jar, the wasp that comes out is typically one of the parasitoids, not the cynipid itself. Well, this is how they get their eggs into the galler. It's a very long ovipositor. Uh, and if they, they're on the outside here, this gall grows very quickly to separate where the larva is from the outside of the gall so that the parasitoids ovipositor cannot reach it. It's vulnerable for a few days when this space hasn't expanded yet, but after that, the parasitoid can't reach it. And that's what that, that um, hollow space is all about. So gall variety is fantastic. I'll just show you a few pictures here. So many of them look like plant diseases. There are 536 species of plant galls west of the Rockies. Most of them are cynipid gallers, uh, and most of them are on oaks. So some of the galls are on, on leaves, uh, and, and they look like galls. Some are on, on stems, um, and they you know, they really do have crazy, crazy shapes. This one really does look like a plant disease. It's actually one, two, three, four, five, a number of different cynipid galls. Some of them look like pottery or like brains. Um, this is a very common gall on uh, Quercus gariana, the uh, Oregon oak out and along the west coast. Uh, and, and galls actually have uh, an interesting uh, relationship with our own history. Uh, long ago, thousands of years ago, we figured out that if you grind up uh, this particular gall, and by the way, this hole is, is where the galler has exited the gall. If you grind it up and mix it with some chemicals, it forms a black ink. And that is the ink that, that most of human history was written with. The Bible, the Magna Carta, the Declaration of Independence, all of the, what the, the monks and scribes were writing through the Middle Ages, it was made from gall ink. Um, so the existence of these oak, gall, oak galls uh, enabled us to record all those great things we did through the ages. Okay, April is, is also the best time to find uh, out whether you have any polyphemus cocoons on your, your oak tree. When the marcescent leaves are hanging there, it's difficult to see whether any, any uh, cocoons are there as well. But once they drop, the polyphemus cocoons, which are silvery white and, and quite large, are pretty obvious to, to spot. Uh, you want to spot these simply because they're they're neat. That's what the caterpillar looks like. That's what the adult looks like. It's one of the giant silk moths, uh, and and giant silk moths across the country are becoming rarer and rarer. Uh, they're part of the insect decline. So if you can if you can have polyphemus uh, moth caterpillars on your oak trees, it's it's a good thing. May is is when the the new biological year really bursts forth. It's when those leaves start to expand rapidly. And close on the heel of this leaf expansion is the production of the things that eat those leaves, which is largely caterpillars. And close on the heels of, of uh, the development of those caterpillars is spring migration. This is when the, the uh, migrating birds move through. <clears throat> they have timed their migration to uh, come up through the temperate zone as leaves are expanding when you've got peak caterpillar production, because that's what the migrants are eating. And that's what the residents are rearing their, their young on. Uh, any competent birder knows that the best place to look for warblers, for example, is in oak trees. Why? Because they make the most bird food. I had a student, uh, Christy Beal, years ago, who looked at warbler, warbler foraging during migration on different tree families. This is the phagaceae here. This is the amount of minutes 
that she recorded warblers foraging on trees in the family Fagaceae. Well, that includes the oaks, the beeches, and chestnuts. But in her study, the only Fagaceae that were there were, were oaks, so no beeches and no chestnuts. So here's pines and birches and everything else. Um, you can see where the, the warblers are. They are there because that's where most of the caterpillars are. Um, and that's what they're after. So things like the, the purple crested slug caterpillar, the buck moth, the white marked tussock moth, the saddle prominent, double line prominent, white dotted prominent, the checkered fringe prominent, the laugher, the lace cap caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the skiff moth, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the, the uh, variable oak leaf caterpillar, the banded tussock moth, hickory tussock moth, red line panapoda, yellow neck caterpillar, smaller parasa, unicorn caterpillar, the crown slug, the streak dagger moth, the epilated dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the confused wood grain, the spiny oak caterpillar, the most beautiful spun glass uh, slug caterpillar. Uh, and hundreds more are, are on, on oaks. The birds know it, and that's what they are, are thriving on. I have uh, made it a goal to take pictures of all the caterpillars that I could find on our, our uh, property. This is what it looks like today, by the way. Um, and, and these plants are here because we have planted them. We have put the plants back. Uh, and just the moth species, I have taken pictures of 1,134 moth species in my yard. 30% of them use oaks. Uh, and that's why I call oaks keystone plants. I call them keystone plants. First, remember what a keystone is. This is the Roman arch. The keystone is the stone in the middle of that arch. And if you take the keystone out of the arch, the arch falls down. Well, if you take a, a keystone plant out of your local food web, the food web collapses. And that's because keystone plants like oaks are making most of the food. Caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So the number of caterpillars your food web produces is a good measure of how healthy your food web is. And uh, the keystone plants, just 5% of our native plant species are making 75% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. Those are the keystone plants and they're essential. Oaks are the number one keystone plant in 84% of the counties in which they occur. In the mid-Atlantic states, they support 557 species of caterpillars uh, and 950, it's actually 952 now that we know of nationwide. There's no other plant genus that comes close to that. So if you're trying to boost your ecosystem, the best way to do that is to get some oaks into your yard. Now I get asked all the time, which oaks are best? You know, we've got 91 species, nobody's compared all of them. Uh, you wanna make these comparisons locally, which species uh, are, are um, acting best where you are. So I had a, a student look at it quickly this summer. And here are the preliminary results. Um, first of all, all the oaks are good. So if, you, if I compared this, this is uh, the average area eaten in square centimeters um, in, uh, uh, I think it was a sample of 100 leaves. <clears throat> that's quite a bit of the oak material that's being passed on to, to uh, caterpillars. Uh, but there is some variation here. Here's white oak here, black oak, red oak. These guys, all of these oaks here are not different from each other. The poorest performers were the oaks that don't really belong here. Here's water oak. It's a good oak down south, but uh, we're at the very north end of its range, and this was planted out of its range. Same thing with willow oak, the northern edge of its range, so it's not performing very well. This is uh, Chinese. This is uh, sawtooth oak from China, uh, and it's not performing well. It's better than these guys, and this is certainly outside of its range. But the reason is, uh, wherever we had Japanese beetles emerging, they really like the um, sawtooth oaks. So the damage that, that my student was measuring was largely from Japanese beetles from from Asia. So it's a, it, it gave it an uh, artificial um, boost in, in what it looked like it was passing on to our, our native insects. Um, so I wouldn't worry so much about um, which species is going to support life the best. They're all good. I would worry about which species is going to survive best where you are. You want to plant uh, the species that you're, you're interested in in the right soil type, and you want to dodge the diseases that are getting worse and worse for, for oaks. So for example, the uh, bacterial leaf scorch is, is um, pretty bad and it hits the red oak group very hard. So if it's bad where you are, plant one of the white oak uh, species. 
Why do we need so many caterpillars, by the way? Um, well, because the birds eat so many caterpillars. You've heard these chickadee statistics before, but um, chickadees aren't migrants. They're here all year round, but when they reproduce, they need thousands of species of caterpillars to get one clutch to the point where they leave the nest, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars. Uh, and after they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days. So you're talking about tw tens of thousands of caterpillars to make one clutch of a bird that's a third of an ounce. Where are these caterpillars coming from? Well, if you want chickadees to breed in your yard, you've got to make all those caterpillars in your yard uh, because the chickadees only forage 50 meters from the nest. They're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. So if you don't make all of those caterpillars in your yard on plants like oaks, you won't have these breeding birds that's called insect decline directly related to bird decline. So this is why we need so many caterpillars. Um, even if, if, you know, other things eat caterpillars too, but if we just worry about the birds, they eat thousands and thousands. Okay, June. This year, June was the, the month of cicadas. Uh, the periodical cicadas, we've got uh, periodical cicadas that stay in the ground for 17 years, a 17 year brood and the 13 year brood um, this year at my house, we had the emergence of the 17-year brood, and the media went crazy. Um, they, they told, oh, this is going to be a terrible scourge. It's going to be so loud, you'll go crazy. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> they're going to kill your trees. This is the way the media talks about nature all the time. It's always something terrible. Um, it's actually was one of the most fantastic biological events that you'll ever have the privilege to, to witness. This great synchronization of life coming forth, uh, and it only happens once every 17 or 13 years. It was a big emergence this year, uh, and I was pleased because I thought it was getting smaller and smaller every, every year. So for entomologists, uh, Mike Raup calls this our Super Bowl. We were all very, very excited. This is what it looked like at the University of Delaware, and they, these are emergence holes, which is aerating the soil, uh, and <laughs> there were a lot of cicadas around. We actually had 11 Mississippi kites come up and take residence in, in Newark, Delaware for two weeks eating these, these cicadas. So it was a bonanza time for, for the birds. Typical life cycle, the cicada crawls out of the ground at night because it takes a long time to emerge as an adult, um, splits its skin, comes down. Uh, it's very white in the beginning. Um, then it, it grabs on and tans its skin. It has to, has to uh, harden up its exoskeleton until it's, it's black. And only then can it actually fly away. Uh, and when it flies away, the males then go and try to attract females. And they do that by singing. So it depends on which species you're talking about, but the most common one, there are three species uh, that came out at our house. The most common one sounds something like this. And it's pretty consistent. And if you think about it, maybe it can drive you crazy, but only for a few days. Then the females come, they mate. Uh, and this is, of course, what their short life is all about. Then the female, here's her ovipositor. She's, what she's going to do is lay eggs in the stems of trees. Uh, and they love oaks the best, believe it or not. So the ovipositor is like a spear, and she jams it in there, really rams it in there, lays an egg. And when she's through, that, those are the oviposition scars. Uh, and you can recognize them right afterwards. Um, and that, from that point out on most trees, not all trees, but most trees, causes the branch to die. It's called flagging. And this is what people worry about. But you know what? It's nature's pruners. Uh, happens once every 17 years, um, even on small trees. It's just not that big a deal. I had a student uh, look at which trees had the most flagging this year in, in uh, Newark, Delaware. These dark green bars here, or the green bars, were oak species. So there's red oak, white oak, willow oak. Um, here's pin oak. Everything else was, was a different species. So it's very clear that the um, the cicadas preferred oaks. And then they die. And that's it. We won't see them again for another, another 17 years. Um, why stay underground 17 years? It's the same, same story. It's predator satiation. Uh, there's a lot of things that eat these, these cicadas. And if they came out in dribbles and drabs um, and didn't overwhelm the local predator population, uh, most of them would get eaten. But when they come out by the tens of thousands, then the predators can't keep up with them and they get to, to do their thing. Okay, July. Uh, this is when we have the night chorus uh, begin. You know, once upon a time, there was a young woman named Katie who fell in love with a very handsome young man. Alas, he did not share her feelings and he married another. Soon thereafter, he and his young bride were found poisoned in their bed. 
Who perpetrated the crime was never determined, but some say the insects in the trees were watching that night, and each summer they solved the mystery by singing, Katie did, Katie did. You probably all heard this. If you've done any camping in the summertime, you've heard Katie did's. I did a lot of camping when I was young and it's a, it's a very soothing sound to me. There are four species of Katie did's that frequent oak forests. Um, some of them have big spatula-like ovipositors like this. This is a fifth instar, it's not quite an adult yet, but the ovipositor is ready to go. And, and here we are with the fully developed wings. They spend most of their time up in the canopy, so you don't see them a lot during the summer. But when they lay their eggs, they, they paste them, glue them to the side of, of twigs. These eggs have already hatched, but if you see these big things, uh, you don't have to wonder what they are anymore. Those are Katie did eggs. Uh, and then they will sing from um, usually early July right through August, uh, even into September on warm nights. Uh, there's still a few Katie did singing uh, around here. Okay, in August, uh, oak leaves are noted for their toughness. Uh, and it's one of their defenses against particularly caterpillars. They get so tough that, that uh, it's tough, you know, they're just tough to eat. Um, so how do, how do uh, some species of caterpillars get around it? They have adapted to oak leaf toughness uh, in several different ways. And gregarious feeding is one of those ways. They all eat together. And a uh, 100 mouths are easier to get through the oak leaf than a single mouth. So this is the yellow neck caterpillar when it's, when it's young. Here it is when it's older. They're still eating together. And this type of gregarious feeding behavior allows them to deal with those tough leaves without too much trouble. Um, and there's a lot of species of caterpillars that are gregarious just like this. This is the yellow neck caterpillar. This is the... Um, uh, uh, <laughs> the pink striped oak worm, sorry, senior moment. Um, so a number of species do that. This is that oak in my front yard. Uh, I have just walked around and counted all the caterpillars on the lower branches, just the lower branches. I didn't climb any ladders. Uh, and I counted 115 yellow neck caterpillars right down here. Uh, so that's a lot of caterpillars and people say, oh, they're going to they're going to defoliate my tree. They do defoliate a branch. But can you see that branch? No. Can you see any of those caterpillars? No. Um, so don't don't grab the spray can. I mean, this is what your oak's doing. It's producing the caterpillar life that supports the birds and everything else in your yard. There's a woman in uh, um, New Orleans, Tammany Baumgarten, who says we all ought to practice the 10 step program. Take 10 steps back from your trees and all of your insect problems disappear. It's much easier than spraying your, your trees uh, and, and it's much more ecologically sound. And of course, that's the distance we view our trees from. Very few people are looking at the trees very close up. Another mechanism for getting around tough leaf tissue is to become a leaf miner. The toughness is in the outer layer and the, of, of both the top part of the leaf and the lower part of the leaf, the upper and lower epidermis. The parenchymal cells, the mesophyll cells in the middle of the leaf are, are still tender, and that's where the leaf miner lives. Uh, so to be a leaf miner, you have to be really, really small and really thin. This is a serpentine leaf mine. The egg is laid here, and the caterpillar eats its way along. This black line is its frass, its poops. It just leaves it as it goes. Then here it pupated and dropped out of the leaf. This is called a blotch mine. There's the caterpillar right there actually eating away at the edge of the leaf. Here it is expanded. Um, and this is what it looks like, a very fancy picture by Salvador Batenza. And there's the adult, one of the Camomeria species that, that comes out. So once they come out as an adult, uh, they are small, but they look like typical moths. And, and oaks produce a number of species of leaf miners. The Camomeria is the solitary oak leaf miner, the gregarious oak leaf miner, the oak tentiform leaf, mi leaf miner, and, and many others. August is also a very dangerous time to be a, a caterpillar because there's so many things that eat caterpillars and their populations all get large in August. This is a potter wasp that has just stung this, this yellow striped oak worm. Uh, so the oak worm is all stiff now, it's stiff as a board, but it's alive. So the wasp is gonna carry this oak off to its, its little mud pot, stuff it in there and lay an egg on it. Uh, and then the egg will hatch and the larva will eat the caterpillar alive. It sounds nasty, but this is a form of, of refrigeration. The, you know, if they stung and killed the caterpillar, the caterpillar would rot before the wasp egg even, even hatches. So this keeps the caterpillar alive long enough to keep its, its meat, its, its you know, food, its tissues healthy 
uh, and, and fresh so that the, the wasp larva can eat it without eating decaying food. That's how it works. Um, here's a, an egg mass of the, the yellow neck caterpillar. Right after they were laid, within minutes of them being laid, a tiny little parasitoid, another uh, wasp shows up. This is an egg parasitoid, probably an inserted parasitoid that's going to lay its eggs within these, these, uh, the eggs of the caterpillar. Uh, and after uh, uh, several days, those wasps, the, the babies, they're not babies anymore. The wasps that were created by laying eggs in these, in these uh, Lepidoptera eggs are now emerging. And look, at, they've hit a huge percentage of them. So these parasitoids are helping keeping the caterpillar population in, in balance. Um, tachinid flies are another uh, very potent type of, of parasitoid. We call them parasitoids instead of parasites because parasitoids kill their, their prey. Uh, but they only kill, you know, they eat one a regular predator eats several in its lifetime, but a parasitoid only eats and kills one individual. Um, so tachinids are, are laying eggs in lots of insects, but mostly caterpillars. And it's very difficult to find a caterpillar in August that does not have a tachinid egg on it. This is a saddleback caterpillar. Um, there's a tachinid egg right there. There's a tachinid larva that has uh, it hatched from an egg someplace else and is already uh, tunneled into the caterpillar. These are its breathing tubes so that it can, it's, you know, it's immersed in a, a bio soup here. So it's got to put out its spiracles so it can breathe air. Here's a teramalid wasp, which is laying eggs into this caterpillar as well. So this guy hasn't hatched yet, but this caterpillar is dead three times over. There's no way it's going to reach adulthood. And that's very typical for caterpillars in, in August. Uh, here's a contracted uh, Daytana caterpillar with four uh, tachinid eggs laid on it. Here are three that haven't hatched yet on its head, and here's one that already has hatched and is buried into the caterpillar, so it's not going to make it as well. This is a black blotch caesura caterpillar who has figured out how to fool the tachinids. It puts these are white markings, but they look just like tachinid eggs. So the adult fly comes and looks and says, "Uh oh, somebody's already here. They've beaten me to it," uh, and then they leave this caterpillar alone. Natural selection is a wonderful thing. Another way to dodge your predators some of the time is to tumble off the leaf when a predator comes and just hang by a thread. You can't see the thread there, but it's hanging by a thread until the danger passes. And then they can inch their way back up and get back on the leaf. Um, there are Braconid wasps that have figured out that's what caterpillars do. So uh, they will reach over the edge of the leaf and hand over hand, pull up the, the silken thread They'll pull up the silken thread and then lay uh, eggs into the caterpillar, or they'll shinny down the, the uh, silken thread until they get to the caterpillar and lay eggs there. So again, it's tough to be a caterpillar in August. Okay, September, the last month we're gonna deal with, this is um, when we have peak cricket populations. Everybody knows the crickets are on the ground crawling around, but they're crickets in trees too. They're called bush crickets and tree crickets. Uh, they're usually yellow or green. Uh, and I'm going to talk about tree crickets that occur on, on oaks. Um, they want to uh, mate successfully, just like, like uh, Katie did and just like um, the cicadas. So you have to get the sexes together. Uh, and and uh, it's the males that sing and try to attract females. Females are looking for the loudest singer. I forgot to tell you that with the Katie Dids, but the Katie Dids are loud because the female is judging male quality based on the quality of the song. It's only a large male that can make a loud song, and a large male suggests good genes, and that's what they're looking for. So these crickets have figured out a way to um, cheat a little bit. They find a hole in a leaf, or they eat and create a hole in the leaf. Then they stick their head through that and raise their wings uh, and sing into that hole. And if the leaf is at all in the shape of a par parabola, it projects the sound out farther and louder than it would if the Cricket was just singing on, on the leaf. So uh, this guy is saying, I'm a big male, when in fact he's not really, but um, he's smart male. So maybe that's good enough for the female. And then he attracts more, more females. And they're doing that right now uh, on warm nights. You can go out and see this happening. Uh, September is also the most time you're most likely to see walking sticks. Walking sticks are called walking sticks because uh, they look like sticks and they walk. They are uh, phasmids. Um, um, the orthopteroid type uh, insects stay up in the canopy uh, most of the year, but during uh, the, the fall, they start to come down. Um, 
they're just very interesting. Sometimes we see them on the, the sides of our houses, but uh, they are they can be quite common in oak forests. There are records of, of uh, walking sticks defoliating certain forests in, in Virginia in West Virginia. I've never seen this, but uh, apparently it can can occur. All right, we've gone through through uh, a year of what's happening on the, the uh, oak in my front yard. Um, and this is something I don't have to remind you of. You know, we humans have created a biodiversity crisis on on planet Earth. And I call it a crisis because it's going to come back and, and bite us. It's a crisis, not just for the biodiversity, but for us. You hear all the time, well, the birds are disappearing, the insects are disappearing. They're not disappearing. There's no, no mystery to it. We're killing them. We're killing our birds. We're killing our insects. We're now in the sixth great extinction event, but this is the first extinction event the Earth has ever witnessed that has been caused by an animal, another organism. And, and that, of course, is, is us. So it is a global crisis because the loss of this biodiversity, uh, it's the biodiversity that runs the ecosystems that, that we all depend on. We are products of nature. We're totally dependent on the life support systems that nature produces for us. So it's a global crisis, but it has a grassroots solution. It's something we each can address every single day. There are four things that every landscape has to accomplish today. It has to be capturing carbon, pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, locking it up in, in plant tissues, and then having those tissues pump it into the ground. It has to manage uh, the watershed. Everybody lives in a watershed. Nobody has the ethical right to destroy that watershed. Uh, it's got to support a diverse community of pollinators. We need pollinators not because they pollinate a third of our crops, because they pollinate 80% of all trees and 90% of all flowering, not just trees, plants. If we lost our pollinators, we lose 80 to 90% of the, of the plants on the planet. So that's not an option at all. And every landscape has to support a complex food web that supports the biodiversity that runs the ecosystems, again, that we de depend on everywhere. We have to do this everywhere, not just in parks and preserves. If you plant an oak, you have addressed three of these uh, essential ecological uh, goals. You're going to capture more carbon over the life of that oak. The, the oak manage the watershed better than anything else because of their huge root systems. They support a, a complex food web better than anything else because they're supporting more types of, of uh, species. The only thing they don't do better than other plants is support a diverse community of pollinators because they are wind pollinated. But three out of four is, is pretty good. Despite all of these landscape attributes though, our, our oaks are, are in trouble. Um, the giants are gone. You know, we cut them down first because we got more wood out of them. And, and oak wood is, is wonderful building material. Um, the percentage of oaks in our eastern forest is now half of what it was when Europeans first came, came here. Um, 28 of our 91 North American oak species are threatened. One third of, of oak species around the world are actually endangered because a lot of these have very small distributions, very small ranges. And if you put a parking lot on that, that small range, you've, you've endangered them. The Oregon white oak, for example, the primary uh, oak up and down the, the, the coast, particularly from Northern California, right through Washington, it's lost 97% of its range to agriculture. Uh, there are 2,300 species in, in Great Britain that rely on oaks that are now threatened because of the loss of oaks in Great Britain. You know, they're rebuilding uh, Notre Dame Cathedral, and they want to do it the way they, they uh, did it originally, which means the roof has to be entirely made. The beams have to be made out of oaks. So it's going to take 6,000 large oak trees from France to make that roof root. And, and that'll be just about all of them is going to go into one piece of, of architecture. So there's no mystery about why our oaks are, are in trouble. We humans live our lives during a very brief instant in ecological time, and we can't return the ancient oaks to the landscapes that were once here, but we can start the process. And in no time at all, the oaks that we plant today do become large enough to fully assume their keystone positions. This is an oak I planted in my, my yard. I've got to get a picture of what it looks like today, but uh, it is much bigger and it hasn't taken that long. We are all responsible for good earth stewardship. Why is that? Because we all require healthy ecosystems. Every single one of them, every single person on the planet requires a healthy ecosystem. So we should all be responsible for good earth stewardship. The very best way to exercise your responsibility is to embrace the power of oaks. So for the sake of our turkeys, our chickadees, 
our woodpeckers, our warblers, our, our jays, our thrushes, our emeralds, our prominence, our, our gallers, our cynipid gallers, our weevils, our orthopterans, and many, many more. Plant an oak, plant a living community, plant the future. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Hopefully you're, you heard that uh, wonderful applause. Um, we do have some time for some questions, Tim, just, if, just unfortunately we're um, running out of time. So we are gonna have a few questions. So anybody? Wow. All right, yes, ma'am. So I'll, I'm going to paraphrase. So Dr. Talon, we have a question about if we if you've got a um, a sapling in your yard of an oak, at at what stage should you um, relocate that? As far as um, not only time of year, but also the the, the um, age of the plant. What would be the best time to to relocate it? If you have an oak uh, that germinates. Uh, in the in the spring, if you see the first green leaves in the spring, move it that fall. Let it let it uh, grow that spring, but then dig it up that fall. If you wait more than one year, its root system really does go out a lot farther than you think, and you're going to have to root prune it to to move it. Not impossible to move it then, but the general rule would be move it as soon as you as you can. Um, so you could even move it in the spring, but um, I would I would wait till the fall. Let it have a, a summer's worth of of growth, and then move it. Right about now, September is a great time to, to plant trees. Okay. All right. Um, David? Uh, urban question, a rural question. Um, I work for the city of Raleigh um, and for America. But how do we help you and help us get your book into more um, familiar with policymakers and how we can be a person of our urban landscape uh, in a great way uh, of a project? But then south, uh, long leaf pines, right? Or the sort of movement to replant long leaves or the disappearance. There's a competition for, for oaks and, and pines, in particular long leaves, and we should get all the uh, uh, ecosystem back up to the south. Did you hear any of that, Doug? You're you're going to have to paraphrase again. Okay. All right. Here, um, so from a from an urban standpoint, um, he's wondering how um, David, you help me out here. Um, how to uh, use your information to help convince uh, the policymakers to use more oaks in an urban environment? Uh, well, that's obvious. Give them a copy of my book, <laughs> which I have for sale. Today. <laughs> there you go. Um, you know, policymakers, uh, not all of them, but many of them are elected officials. Uh, you people elect them. Make it known that this is important to you. Uh, and if they don't address it, you're not going to vote for them. Policymakers or people who get elected do what the electrical, electrical, the electorate wants. They, they want to be elected. So uh, regardless of what they think personally, they're going to do what the loudest voices tell them to do. So be the loudest voices. If, if uh, the city of Raleigh or anybody says, this is important to us, let it be known. You know, letter writing campaigns, uh, with, with our, our social media these days, we can communicate almost anything almost instantaneously. So that's the way to get policy to change. Simply let it be known that this is important to the people that elect these people. Um, and really, they're, they're, you know, the, the city managers who aren't elected, who are, who are making tree choices and stuff, they're using uh, tree lists that were generated back in the 70s. They were generated by horticulturists, not by ecologists. So it's a matter of education. Uh, and and um, saying, you know, look, let's change some policy here. And there, there are a lot of places that are doing it successfully. So it's not impossible. 
All right, thank you. And then the last question um, is, that, you know, there's a big push here for replanting longleaf pine. Um, is there a the competition between the two? Um, can they coexist? Absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> you know, if you look at pine barrens up and down the, the coast, the coastal plain pine ecosystem, it's pines and oaks. Uh, so you want to put the right species there, the ones that do well in sandy soils and everything, but um, they have coexisted together for forever. So no problem there. All right, well, we have run out of time, but again, thank you so much, Dr. Tallamy, for, um, for being available for us today and, um, and for all you do. Well, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks. Thank